An eel is a freshwater fish. It has started life in the Sargasso Sea. It drifts over in the larval form and it is programmed by nature to make its way upriver. And it does so. It has an incredible sense of smells. All these little elvers lock on to the rivers from Portugal, Spain, France, England, right up to the north. And this invasion, this seeding of all the continental rivers has taken place over thousands and thousands of years. And the average length of their life in a river would be, of the ones I catch, would be 15 to 20 years, say, in the river test. They become swimming machines. I, I find them the most wonderful and mysterious creatures, and I owe my life to them, in a way, my working life to them. My name is Michael Brown, and we're sitting outside my smokery, just outside Hambridge, overlooking a very peaceful corner of the Somerset Levels, and we're sitting just a few yards away from the beach log pile, which is rather diminished, but the beach is essential to our smoking efforts here. It's all wood-fired. There's no electricity or gas used at all. There is just a, a sucker out of fan, which you can hear wearing away. Would you like me to turn that off? Come, sir. So it's all wood fire, and we're standing by, it, we can feel the latent heat from this wood smoker. This is a version of a, a machine that I saw actually in the docks area of Hamburg. I was taken there by the guy who actually bought Elvis from us, and we went to this smokery, which had ten of them in a row in this smokery, which was enormous. In a day, they smoked more eel there than we smoked in the whole year. Back in the mid-70s, I was travel writing, and I was invited down here by a friend to uh, catch elvers, which are baby eels. And I came down here and I got so excited by the whole thing, I actually took over the business from him. And um, I became so involved in it, I never actually wrote anything more except checks. I got very involved in elvering, and I supplied elvers to the restocking market in Germany. And then towards the end of the 70s, it, because it was seasonal, I used to catch eels out here on the Somerset levels, all the reens and ditches are full of eels, or were full of eels, and I would catch them by nets and I would do it at night and I would sell them to the Dutch and I always got rock bottom price. I'm very cross with them once, I said, so what do you do with them? And the Dutchman said, um, we, we smoke them. And I said, well, that, that's interesting. Well, I'm gonna have a go at that. So I did. An eel for smoking has to be full of fat stored energy. And that creature is reached when it's ready to make its long journey back to Sargasso. It's a bit like a sort of jumbo jet full of fuel. It's got this wonderful fat in it. And that eel is only caught in its downriver migration. And it's caught generally by river keepers. So towards the end of the 70s, early 80s, I got in touch with these river keepers and I would buy eels from them and I was smoking them and I was making an absolute mess of it. And they tasted like sort of rubber truncheons, quite revolting. Yeah, you can, you can, the trunk, you can freeze. Yeah, you can freeze that. Because of my German contacts, I found a smokery in South Germany. The little family smokery that smoked trout, but also eels. And I came back, and I was so excited, I rushed into Langport, went down. The night I got back, I went down to the blacksmith, who was a friend of mine, got him to make, start building my first little smoker. And for a year or two, I smoked eels under the apple trees in the back garden. This was 25 years ago, this year. And the product was absolutely fantastic. I was using the right eel, I was using the right process, which is, by the way, hot smoking. That is, you cook them and smoke them at the same time. It's a short, sharp process. What it does is enhance the succulence of the fish. Oh, splendid. Not at all, nice to talk to you, thank you, bye-bye. He just received this lovely parcel and he wanted to know if he could, um, which bits he could freeze. I really thought I had a tiger by the tail. I took it around the restaurants and pubs and hotels and they were quite interested and they, they'd take a sample and there was nothing more heard from them. And when I would follow up, you know, perhaps speak to the landlord's wife or something, she'd go, eels? Oh, snakes! Oh, and I'm in those in here! And I was just about to abandon the whole project. And an English friend of mine, he was in a smokery near London, and he said, Michael, don't give up. What you've got to do is go down the mail order route. There are people out there who will die for smoke deal. Go mail order. It just so happened, in 1982, I did my first thousand. And from that began a little mailing list. 
we're now in the filleting area. In the mornings we'll come in and uh, we will fill it down, the eels that have been smoked, because they really need to chill overnight. Anything that's been smoked the day before gets processed the next day, so it can chill down. For example, there'll be one person nearly always doing a filleting of the eels here, which we sell in four ounce and eight ounce packs. And then also there'll be uh, chicken coming through here, there'll be uh, duck breast. So there's a lot going on here and it's, uh, it's a very busy place. We moved completely up here and, and turned this, which was a, a shed really for my elvering activities, we turned this into a proper smokery. And then by the early 90s, people, locals were coming in saying, look, we don't want mail order, we actually live in Drayton, you, we, we want to come here. So we had to open a shop, so we opened a shop and that was a great success. And then after about two or three years, they'd say, God, this is making us hungry, where can you go and eat around here? So we'd say, well, there's a, quite a good pub down there. There's a very good pub over there. And suddenly we thought, that this is ridiculous. We are sending, I would say, at least three people a day, if not five, off to somewhere else when we could actually... And we used to joke and say, we ought to open a restaurant. Ho, ho, ho. Are you ready to order? Yes, we are. I, can I have the smoked duck, please? Yeah. And I think I'm going to have the smoked meal on rye, please. Garlic potatoes, plain potatoes, or granary bread? I think I'm going to have um, garlic potatoes. And I'll have granary bread, please. Okay, thank you. We're standing here in the restaurant now. This was a granary, and over there, where the till is and the shop, that was where the bulk milk tank was sited. And the kitchen next door was where the cows were actually milked. They pulled the ceiling off, there was a low ceiling for, for hygiene reasons and they found these beams. And all they needed to do to them was to blast them with compressed air and blow what was acres of dust off. But once they'd done, this is a beautiful beam. It's like an umbrella with, with spokes running out. It's, it's just lovely and it just adds to the feel of it. Heaven is being with good friends and having good food at a table. That to me is just heaven. But good food and good friends and that's what's really made this place. There are people who come back here and who will make a point of coming here on their way down to Cornwall and they, what they will often do is call up friends from Dorset or wherever and they'll join them here for a meal and they, they will sit here from sort of 12 through to 3, you know, and have really long natters. It's so, it's so pleasing. And one guy came here once who said to me, our holiday, when we go down to Cornwall, I never feel our holiday until I've come here and had lunch.